so much, Bob. That was really very informative. I hope everyone joins the Red Street. Um, and now we're going to hear from Dr. Andrea Havasi from Boston University Medical Center. And uh, uh, she's going to do a renal presentation. And for those of you who have questions for her, she's going to be with us just for a limited time. She's very overworked. <laughs> I, so, uh, but we're very happy that she's able to share with us today. So make sure you stay on during the break up on Dr. Havasi if you have renal questions. Dr. Havasi. Thank you, Muriel. Hi, everyone. So I work at Boston University at the Amyloidosis Center, and I'm going to talk about the very, very rare form of amyloidosis. So um, amyloidosis is rare to begin with, right? And uh, TTR is one of the rare forms and we have even rarer forms and we are going to talk about them. So we will concentrate on the kidneys because I'm a kidney doctor. So I see patients with uh, amyloid kidney involvement. So we are going to look at all the types of amyloidosis that can affect the kidneys. We will talk about the kidney manifestations, uh, the current treatment options, and then at the end, we will talk about kidney transplantation and how it can be used for, um, amylo uh, for amyloidosis. Everyone knows what amyloidosis is, so I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but uh, you can see that the fibrils, the amyloid fibrils can uh, deposit in all the organs. You heard about it and you know it from uh, personal experience that that's the case. So the question is, when do we suspect amyloidosis in the kidney, right? We have to find the amyloid in the kidney and it's sometimes it's not, not easy. So when the amyloid affects the kidneys, then two things can happen. Number one, the kidney function can get worse. And when we talk about kidney function, we measure the creatinine in the blood. So it's a blood test. Everyone knows about it, I assume. Um, this is the one we monitor when we want to monitor the kidney function. And there is a number which is the GFR or EGFR that is a calculated number from this test. So we look at the creatinine and the EGFR to estimate uh, the patient's kidney function. Now, the other thing that can happen to the kidneys and it happens very often in amyloidosis, then the kidneys become leaky from the damage. So the amyloid fibrils deposit in the kidney, they cause structural damage, and as a result, protein will leak into the urine. So normally we don't have protein in our urine. So I don't have any protein in my urine, but if there is uh, damage to the kidneys, amyloid or lots of other diseases can do the same thing, then there is leakage of protein uh, into the urine that we can measure. And you can see that if there is lots of protein in the urine, then the urine becomes bubbly, like foamy, like when you, um, when you cook beans and the protein leaks out from the beans and makes the, the water bubbly. So it's the same idea. And we monitor the amount of protein to see the extent of damage. So the more protein we have in the urine, the more damage we have in the kidneys. So what types of amyloidosis can affect the kidneys? So the most common form is obviously AL, which we are not covering this, uh, in this session. We talked about hereditary TTR and most of the hereditary uh, TTR doesn't, doesn't affect the kidneys, but there are some mutations, for example, the V30M uh, that typically affects the kidneys. So it does happen, but it's the minority of the TTR cases. Then um, fibrinogen can affect the kidneys, lysozyme, gelsolin, APOA1, APOA2, APOA4. These other two are very, very rare. Uh, AA, we are not going to talk about it today, but we will also talk about LEC2. So these are the proteins that can form amyloid fibrils in the kidney. Now, you can see that these are the hereditary forms. So these are the familiar or inherited forms. So this is the list. You can see most of these rare forms are inherited. And most of them are autosomal dominant with variable penetrance. Now it sounds very scary, this autosomal dominant with variable penetrance, but what it means is that usually we have two genes for every protein in our body. We get one from our mother and we get one from our father. Um, and in this case, 
the problem is that we we get a copy from one of our parents that is not good. It, it will be mutant, it will be an abnormal protein, and that will form the amyloid fibrils. So if it's autosomal dominant, it means that it's enough to get just one copy and we will develop the disease. So one copy either from our mother or from our father will lead to the disease. Fortunately, the, the, uh, there is variable penetrance, so that means actually that not everyone will have the same uh, bad disease. So some people will end up with milder forms and some people will end up with, with worse forms, but it's very variable, even within family. Um, but amongst, you know, different families, the outcome can be quite different, different. Someone could end up on dialysis at the age of 40 and another person could end up uh, on dialysis at the age of 70. So it's very variable. Um, these are the non-hereditary forms, so these are not inherited, and this is APOA4 and LEC2. So these are the, uh, the and actually AA, most of the AA, but we are not going to cover that today. Now, it is very, very important to know which type we are dealing with. And in the amyloidosis center, it's, it's always a challenge to make sure that we have the correct diagnosis, because organ involvement is different, prognosis is different, therapies are different. So we have to make sure that we get it right. So lots of people come in with diagnosis of AL amyloidosis, and then we figure it out that some of them don't have AL, but they have one of the, the other inherited or familiar forms. Um, this is a busy slide. But I thought I will put it up in one piece because depending on who you are, you can actually just concentrate on your disease. So you can see that all these inherited forms or even the non-inherited forms, they affect uh, various organs. And you heard about TTR a lot. Uh, fibrinogen usually affects the kidneys, but sometimes we can find it in the heart, in the vessel, in the GI tract. Lysozyme, it's again GI, liver, kidney, salivary gland. Gelsolin, you heard about it, it affect, affects the nerves, the eyes, the skin, and the kidneys, usually older age. It doesn't start early. But we can find it also in blood vessels, heart, lung, liver, and muscles. APOA1 typically affects multiple organs, kidneys, heart, GI tract, nervous system, skin, larynx, liver, testicles. APOA2, it's mainly kidneys. We do find it in other organs, but clinically, usually it's not relevant. So maybe it's in, in the heart, maybe in autopsy, autopsy studies, we found it uh, you know, in the adrenal glands or pancreas, but usually they don't cause problems uh, clinically. APOA4, it's mainly kidney, very rarely heart. Uh, and LEC2, again, it's mainly kidney, it can be in the liver, it can be in the adrenal gland, um, but the main issue is usually with the kidney. And all these patients and all these different forms, they have different renal outcomes and also different manifestations in the kidney. So for example, fibrinogen, usually people have protein in the urine and they will progress to end-stage renal disease um, over several years. Compared to the other forms, uh, fibrinogen is usually a faster progression. Lysozyme, on the other end, it has a very variable clinical picture and mostly slower progression, so not as fast as fibrinogen. And they do have some, these patients do have some protein in their urine, but usually smaller, smaller amounts. Gelsolin, it's usually mild, slowly progressive, uh, the protein can be just a little bit on the urine or, or, uh, or more, and usually it starts later. Now, APOA1, um, depending on the specific mutation, we see different kidney manifestations. Uh, most of the patients progress slowly, and they do have some protein in the urine, and sometimes actually there is no protein in the urine, but there are some other issues like urinary concentrating defects. So someone cannot concentrate the urine and uh, has to go to the bathroom all the time and drink water all the time. 
but most of the patients have, have some protein and uh, progressive renal disease. Um, APOA2 with protein in the urine, slowly progressive kidney disease. And I have uh, patients who ended up on dialysis at the age of 40, and I have patients who ended up at the age of 60. So it's very variable, the timing, when it will lead to end-stage renal disease. APOA4, that's uh, a slowly progressive kidney disease, and usually they don't have much protein uh, in their urine. LAC2, again, it's a slower progression, and there are people who have no protein in the urine, there are people who have some protein, and there are people who have lots of protein in their urine. So why is it difficult to diagnose amyloidosis? And you already heard about it, that it takes a long time to diagnose it. And you can see that from time of initial symptoms to diagnosis can be actually as long as three years. But lots of the people you know, uh, uh, are diagnosed after one year, so which is a long, long time. And they have to visit lots of physicians. Some of them have to visit more than five physicians to be able to diagnose, to be able to diagnose. And why is it so difficult? Because as we discussed before, the symptoms are not very specific. It can affect multiple organs and all the manifestations, all the symptoms, all the complaints can be the sign of other diseases that are much, much more common. So, you know, someone comes in with neuropathy, as you discussed, it can be from diabetes or the, uh, if we concentrate on the kidney, someone comes in with protein in the urine. You know, most of my patients, um, in my regular clinic, they don't have amyloidosis. They have diabetes, they have other glomerular diseases, other rare ki uh, kidney diseases. Very few patients uh, have amyloidosis. So it's, it's, uh, you have to look for it. You have to think of it. Otherwise, you will not find it. Obviously, if you have a family history, it's easier to, to get it right. But the first person in the family who is uh, being diagnosed, that's always a challenge. And usually we need a tissue biopsy for diagnosis, and usually we biopsy the kidney. But I just wanted to mention that sometimes we can actually just get the diagnosis from fat pad. So just a, a, a biopsy of the fat tissue. Here you can see on, the, on this picture how we do it. Um, for most of the amyloidosis, amyloid forms, that the more, more common forms, uh, it's quite good. Most of the times we can get the diagnosis. Unfortunately, for the rare forms, um, it's much less useful. Only 15 to 42 percent of the patients will have positive fat. Um, and in the other patients, we have to biopsy the kidney to get the right diagnosis. Now, this slide is a little bit uh, um, discouraging, I think, because it shows the current treatment options for the various types. And if you look at down here, the fibronogen, the lysozyme, the gelsoline, the APOA1, APOA2, you can see that there is no specific treatment at this point, unfortunately. So what we are doing is mainly conservative management. Um, and we, we don't have therapies like uh, patisserin or tefamidus, like for TTR, and we don't have chemotherapy or stem cell transplant as for AL amyloidosis. Um, and because it's a rare disease, and some of you asked this question, if there are any drug studies currently for these rare forms, and unfortunately, I had to answer that we don't have, because it, this is, these are the rare form of a rare disease. So it's very hard to, um, to develop drugs for, for these kinds of diseases, but we never know. The technology is out there, so maybe one day we will have something. So basically, it's conservative management in terms of the kidneys. We have to control the blood pressure. People have to have a healthy diet. Uh, if they have protein in their urine, then they have to avoid salt because the more salt they eat, um, the more protein will leak out. And, uh, uh, and usually they have swelling in their legs, so that can get worse with lots of salt intake. Then, you know, we monitor the labs very carefully. We make sure that the bicarbonate is normal, for example. We make sure that the potassium and the phosphorus is normal, and we have medications for that. 
um, if the diet uh, doesn't work. So if everything fails and the, and, um, the kidneys are um, very weak, then we can start thinking about kidney transplantation. And that is an option for most of uh, these rare uh, amyloidosis patients. So hereditary TTR, it used to be a combined liver kidney transplantation. Now with the, uh, in, in patients who have kidney involvement, right? We mentioned that only uh, 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 some mutations like the V30M, which, is, which affects the kidneys, but in those patients, it's usually liver kidney transplantation. But now we have the stabilizers and the siRNA technology. So now it is changing, but we don't know yet how that will uh, change kidney disease in those patients. Most likely um, it will work because if it works for the heart and it works for the nerves, it should work for the kidney also, but we will see with time. Now fibronogen. Unfortunately, there is a relatively high rate of recurrence in the transplant, but it's not a, a contraindication. We just have to know that it can come back. And because the, most of the fibronogen is coming from the liver, we could do liver kidney transplantation. Um, unfortunately, patients don't do much better with the combined liver transplantation, uh, but it has been done. Um, so in young patients, there might be benefit to do the liver and the kidney together. Maybe in older patients, it just makes sense to do the kidney, which is um, a little bit less uh, risky than doing two at the same time. Now in lysozyme patients, um, we do recommend kidney transplantation. And for a long time, there is no recurrence in the transplant kidney. So most of the patients do quite well. Now in gelsolin, um, we recommend kidney transplantation. Um, again, the transplant kidney is, remains healthy for a long time in these patients. There is some recurrence, but usually it's very slow. And even after, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, it's not cl clinically significant. APOA1, uh, excellent kidney transplant survival because of slow disease recurrence. Um, and some people with APOA1 have um, liver involvement also. And if they have liver failure and kidney failure at the same time, then they can have actually uh, both done at the, at the same time, liver and kidney, and um, they have um, relatively good outcomes. APOA2, it's, as we mentioned, it mainly affects the kidneys, so we just have to worry, worry about the kidneys, and um, most of the patients do quite well. Um, recurrence rate is low, and it's very slow. APOA4, we recommend, uh, sorry, we recommend kidney transplantation, very limited uh, number of patients, but it looks like it, uh, the recurrence rate is quite low. And it's the same with LEC2, um, because it's a newly discovered disease, right? So over the last 10 years or so, we don't have many patients who had kidney transplantation done, but the ones who had it, they did quite well. And there is another piece of data from donor kidneys. So someone gave a kidney to someone else, and it turned out that the original donor had LEC2. So now the new patient got a kidney with LEC2, and it looks like that they did well. Uh, the disease did not progress. So LEC2 patients uh, do well with kidney transplantation. So just very quickly, a few slides. Um, how to do this kidney transplantation, when to do it. So we say that all patients with advanced kidney disease or end-stage renal disease should be considered. Um, so we send everyone for evaluation, except if they have absolute contraindications. And I put up a few here. For example, obviously we cannot give a kidney transplant with, to someone who has uh, an active infection or malignancy or uncontrolled psychiatric disease, or if someone has a history of non-adherence, so if someone is not taking medications, not following up with doctors, then 
they cannot be uh, considered. And also if someone has a short life expectancy for any reason, then it's an absolute contraindication. And there are a few others, but these were the major ones um, I put up here. So when shall we do the kidney transplantation? The best option would be to do it before someone starts dialysis. So that's the preemptive kidney transplantation. So we always try to do that if it's a possibility. Usually we start thinking about it when the GFR is less than 20. You know, we talked about this is the uh, estimate of the kidney function, the GFR number. Or we expect the start of dialysis within 6 to 12 months. So then we start talking about kidney transplantation just to make sure that, uh, you know, we have enough time to go through the workup and find a potential donor. Uh, there is an exception to this rule, and that is if someone needs a combined organ transplantation, for example, heart and kidney. So if the heart is really bad, the kidneys are borderline, they could last a little longer. But if someone gets a heart transplant at, at, at some point, then maybe we can just do it together. Um, and the same for liver and kidney. So if one organ is more advanced, then we don't need to wait for both of the organs to be uh, very sick. We can just do the combined transplantation when one organ is very sick and the other one is still just, uh, uh, you know, halfway, halfway there. So early referral is very important, as I mentioned, to have time for the workup, uh, to talk about living versus disease donation. So if you have a living donor, someone who is willing to give you a kidney, there is no wait time. Basically, just the workup has to be completed and the transplantation can, would, would go ahead if everything is okay. Now, if it's a deceased donor though, there is a long wait time. It's three to seven years, depending on where you live. Um, and it's not just country, but also region in, in the US, for example. So there are certain areas where it's shorter, there are more organs available, and there are areas where there are uh, less organs available for transplantation. And this also depends on the lots of patient factors um, because the, it has to be a very good match between the donor and the recipient. So there are some people who have lots of, um, so first of all, the blood group, there are blood groups that are rare and there are blood groups that are more common. So they can get it quicker or, or they have a, um, you know, uh, or a longer wait time. And also some patients have antibodies against um, other people because they got blood transfusions or something else in the past. So they developed uh, antibodies. So it's harder to find a kidney for them that they will not uh, reject. So if you have a living donor, it's much easier. If you have to wait for a deceased donor, there is a long wait time. And I didn't put up age here because we are changing age criteria all the time. You know, 20 years ago, it was like you ha had to be below the age of 60, then 65, then 70. Then if somebody is in a good shape, maybe even, you know, a little bit more than 70, it's a possibility, especially if it's a living donor. Because if someone is, let's say, 70 years old today, right, and the wait time is seven years, then that person would be 77 by the time would get a deceased kidney, um, kidney transplant. But if it's a living donation, then it could be done soon, then maybe it's still possible even at the age of 70. The pre-transplant workup uh, for the recipient includes lots of tests. So I'm not gonna uh, list it here, but lots of lots of tests and lots of lots of visits uh, in uh, including a transplant nephrologist, a transplant surgeon, cardiology, psychiatry, pharmacy, social worker, etc. And the donor has to go through a similar evaluation just to make sure that the donor is healthy enough. And if we take out one kidney, that donor will be okay with that one um, kidney that is left. Uh, we know that one kidney is enough. There are people who are born with one kidney and they don't have any problems. So one kidney is enough. 
but we just have to make sure that that person will not develop diabetes or very bad high blood pressure later uh, because that would put them uh, into increased risk for, for kidney failure in the future. And one more important thing is these decisions um, regarding uh, approval of the kidney transplantation um, is made during a transplant committee meeting when everyone is there and all the results are back and everyone um, has to be on the safe, uh, same page. Um, and then if the recipient and the donor is approved, then uh, the transplantation can go ahead. And I think this was my last slide, so thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Havasi. That was really wonderfully helpful and informative, and I learned a lot, so I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. No and now uh, Dr. Havasi is going to spend uh, th the break answering questions, for, and if anyone else wants to hang around and listen, or that's great. But for those of you that really, really need that 15-minute break, and I imagine that many of you, please feel free to take it, and then uh, you can return in 15 minutes. And um, so uh, let's, uh, let's take that official break now, okay? All right. And uh, with that official break then, we start the, the Q&A for Dr. Havasi. And I have, I'm, try, I'm just looking at the questions. There were questions submitted at, ahead of time, Dr. Havasi. So maybe yes. you can say a few words about those. So the first one was, remain on dialysis before transplant. Could you repeat it? Sorry, because I lost you for a oh, second. Sorry, yeah. How long can a patient oh, okay. remain on dialysis? So, no, there are two ways to answer this question. What is optimal? And the optimal would be the least time, the better, right? Because transplant is better than being on dialysis. On dialysis, you know, it's either three times a week if it's a hemodialysis or sometimes every, uh, every day if it's a slow home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis every day. And still, it's not a perfect um, way to deal with the kidney failure. The, the poison levels are still high in the blood. So the less time someone spends on dialysis, the better it is. But how long it can be? I have patients who have been on dialysis for 10 years they are still alive. Um, I, now you could ask why they were not transplanted, why they didn't get the kidney transplant. Actually, there are some patients who don't want to get it. They don't want to take the immunosuppressants. They don't want to take the risk. Maybe they didn't expect to survive five, 10 years. That's the other thing. I have a patient who said, I thought I would be dead. I was told I would be dead in a few years and still not dead. And you know, now it's the age is a, is a problem. So everyone is a little different. But if you can get a kidney transplant, go for it. Because that is better. It's not just lifestyle. I mean, think about it. You have to take the medications. And yes, you have to follow up with the doctors. But you don't need dialysis every day or every other day. And, and related to the kidney transplant, then and one of the other questions was, after a kidney transplant, can the old, I assume maybe you only get one, Kidney transplant because it asks if the old kid if the old effect kidneys can cause any damage. So I'm yeah. guessing you so, get one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So we don't take out the old kidneys, so they stay inside. But okay. those kidneys are dead. They are shrunken. They don't work. So they will not bother anyone. But we don't take them out because it would be a big surgery. It's in the back of the, you know, in the, in the back inside. And the new kidney actually goes to the front, to the belly. So it's, it's a different location. Um, and some people actually get two kidney transplants. So one fails, then you can do another one later on. So young patients, they do have two kidney transplants or even three very rarely because if you were a child when you had kidney failure then you know you survive and and the uh, the transplant kidney will you know will fail after 15 20 years then you get a new one so but the old ones they will not bother um, anyone they are just there okay uh, the 
the, another one was, uh, if as Dr. Wall has found, there are some affected smaller organs with amyloid, do these organs have to be transplanted as well? Or are we just left? Yeah. No, so, you know, we just have to replace an organ when they fail completely. And it's very rare. So even kidneys, it depends what kind of amyloid, uh, but when it's a treatable form of amyloid like AL, they can get better, for example. So we don't need to replace, and we cannot replace most of the organs. So it's very limited what, when we, what we can replace. So kidneys, we would just replace it only when they failed or they are almost failed. Um, heart, right? It's very hard to replace it. Well, we don't even have enough hearts. Um, and it's not a simple thing. And liver, we can, but then we get to the other organs and we don't even have transplantation for them. And, and usually it's not, uh, it's not crucial. Just because we have amyloid in an organ, it doesn't mean that it fails. So for example, sometimes in the liver, like LEC2, we have a little bit of amyloid, but the liver function is completely fine. It's functioning fine, no problem. So then we don't need to worry about transplantation. And this one is not directly related to LEC2, but it's related to kidney. So one of the, um, somebody posted anonymously wanting to know about whether mild kidney failure is considered death because they had a grandmother and a great grandmother pass away in their 70s um, due to kidney failure. Uh, however, that they mentioned the Jessalyn amyloidosis. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, so usually if it's just a mild kidney disease, it doesn't lead to death. So then something else happened, I assume. But people do die from uh, kidney failure if we don't start dialysis. So if the kidneys are completely shut down, then we have two options. We can start dialysis or we can say that, or, or kidney transplant, or we can say that, you know, I don't want to do dialysis because some people don't want to do dialysis. And then, then um, you know, there is not much we can offer at that, at that point. Um, but I don't know, Jelsaline, was it like just mild kidney? Because there are lots of people with mild kidney disease with Jelsaline and they progress very slowly. So some people die with mild kidney failure, not because of mild kidney failure. Okay. And, and another one, I think you talked a little bit, I think you talked about the afibrogen Fibrinogen. <laughs> Fibrinogen, yes. Um, and the, the question was how common and and elect two. How common they are? That's the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fibrinogen is a little bit more. Uh, actually, I, I cannot really compare the two because the, with the lac two, we don't know exactly how common it is at this point. Um, fibrinogen, it's easier because you know it's an inherited form. And it has been around for a long time. So it usually runs in families. So now we have, you know, lots of the families already in, in databases. So it's very, very rare. And then LEC2, it's not inherited and it's a relatively new form. And some people think it's more common, especially um, in certain countries, in certain ethnicities. We will see how common it is. It's not a common form, right? It's still a very, very, very rare form of a rare disease. Yeah. So, you know, there are support groups for LEC2. So you, you can see how many people there are, not too many. So it's, it's, it's a very, very rare form. But uh, it's also possible that we have pa some patients who were not diagnosed. So we will see. And I, the, another one I have, uh, I thought maybe fit, would fit in this. Tracy, honey, you're cutting out. Oh, am I cutting out? Okay, in, sorry. In and out, kinda. Let me adjust my mic, maybe talk a little louder. Um, the, the one, I had another one here. They were asking about differences between ATTR and APOA1, meaning how, how the amyloid is, I think, is created differently from each and not really about the organs impacted. And I don't even know if we know an answer to this, but how it starts from the beginning, maybe differently or why they're different. So I'm not sure. So they are different proteins, right? they mainly come from the liver. So they are abnormal proteins. That's a similarity between the two. There is a mutant protein. Uh, I assume we are talking about the mutant TTR, not the white type TTR. But for TTR, we have white type and we have mutant. And for the APOA, 
it's ApoA1, right? That's what you asked. So that's a mutant protein. So that's the similarity, but they are different proteins and they affect different organs. So if you see the ApoA1, usually the, that was that big long list uh, which organs it can affect and then TTR, you know that most of the forms affect the heart and the nerves and very rarely the kidneys and some some other organs also. It's a, it's a systemic disease, but clinically, usually it's not uh, relevant. So they are just, you know, with, with all these amyloid forming proteins, depending on what they are and what kind of mutation we have in the protein, they behave differently. I hope I answered the question. If not, then please yeah, write post another it. one. Yeah. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And I think we're about right on time for the break. There's maybe three or so minutes left. Those, those are the questions I had that I found that appeared to be specific for kidney and elect two. Right, and great. as Dr. Havasi mentioned, if you guys still have questions, please continue to post them because we will collect these unanswered questions yeah. for and later. I 